The opening of a film is important. Outside of the opening credits, it's the first thing that the audience sees, and it gives the viewer a glimpse of what they're about to watch. As such, any filmmaker worth their weight in gold makes it a priority to give their film a strong opening. In this video, I'll be explaining five goals of an opening sequence. It goes without saying that the primary goal of an opening sequence is to hook the audience. Everything else stems directly from a need to grab the attention of the viewer. The tone of a film is one of those things that isn't really considered until it's broken. It informs how the plot, characters, and their actions are supposed to be interpreted. Let's take a look at the opening of Deadpool. The audience visually explores a frozen moment in time of Deadpool engaged in an action scene. Here we see meta gags such as Deadpool creator Rob Liefeld's name on a coffee cup, a magazine with Ryan Reynolds on the cover, and a picture in a wallet taking a jab at Reynolds' Green Lantern movie. Cast and crew names are replaced with jokes, Deadpool's crotch is planted firmly in a guy's face while he gives another guy a wedgie, and all of it is juxtaposed with Juice Newton's Angel of the Morning. From the opening credits, the audience is told everything they need to know about the tone of the movie. It's a superhero film, but one with tongue planted firmly in cheek. Let's take a look at a different example, this time La La Land. From the beginning, the aspect ratio widens to reveal the words presented in Cinemascope as color fills the screen. There's a shot of a bridge packed with cars, with snippets of audio from each one as we pass them. Then the camera settles on a little green car as the first musical number kicks in. A heavily choreographed sequence takes place before we snap back to reality and the film's title appears. From there we meet Emma Stone's character and the film continues. This opening arguably establishes style a tad more than tone, but tone is still established here. Beginning with the Cinemascope logo, audience members with a bit of film knowledge gather that this is a bit of a tribute to classic Hollywood. Then we get into the meat of the opening. Musicals have their own rules when it comes to song and dance numbers. The idea of a perfectly coordinated dance number on a packed bridge is absurd, but director Damien Chazelle plays with that, even taking it into borderline avant-garde territory later in the film. With the performance of Another Day of Sun, the audience learns that La La Land is a musical. Paired with the Cinemascope opening, it's a send-up to classic Hollywood musicals. The opening does something else, but I'll get into that later in the video. Sometimes the audience requires a little background information before diving into the world the film presents. Setup openings do two things, provide information that acts as groundwork for the rest of the narrative, and establish the rules of the world. Disney's animated films are great examples of the former. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Cinderella, and Hercules all give the viewer a little background information before properly introducing the main characters. Even the Star Wars films do this with the iconic text crawls. Before there was a massive franchise, there was only a new hope. That text crawl gave the audience information about the rebellion and their war with the Empire, the goals of Princess Leia, and the threat of the Death Star. It's an effective, almost pre-opening that gets the viewer prepared for what they're about to watch. Men in Black's opening is a good example of a rule-establishing setup. The film starts with an officer pulling over a truck smuggling people across the U.S. border. Two agents dressed in black suits arrive on the scene and commandeer the situation. Agent K begins speaking Spanish to the people who were in the truck, where he finds one clearly doesn't know the language. K and the old agent J take the man to a secluded area where it's revealed that not only do aliens exist, but so does a secret government organization dedicated to communicating and keeping the peace with them. More information gets revealed about the MIB as the film unfolds, but this opening gives the audience a crash course lesson in the rules of this world. Whether you realize it or not, every film has themes. Strong themes often lead to compelling films, but to make those themes effective, it's important to establish them early on. Earlier, I mentioned the opening for La La Land. Let's circle back around and look at that again, particularly with the opening song, Another Day of Sun. Some may consider using a musical to discuss themes to be cheating, but it's a good example. The song begins with a girl reminiscing about a boy she used to know and maybe love from her hometown. Whenever they would watch movies at the theater, she felt the films were calling to her, so she left home to pursue that dream. A guy begins singing about his attempts to break into the music industry. The song is about the struggle, perseverance, and ambition involved in making a dream a reality. By having this song at the beginning, the film establishes that this is one of the key themes and one the audience should take note of. Now let's take a look at Pixar's Coco. It's a little hard to pin down the exact moment where the film's opening ends, so let's examine everything up until the introduction of Dante. 
The film opens with Miguel giving a brief history of his family, how his great-great-grandfather was a musician and left his family to pursue music. His great-great-grandmother banned music from the family house and began making shoes to provide for her daughter. Eventually, it became a family business. The audience is then shown a picture of Miguel's great-great-grandmother Mama Imelda on the family's ofrenda before showing Miguel's relationship with his family, particularly his mama Coco, and his desires to become a musician. Not only does this opening introduce the film's themes nicely, but it also lays the groundwork for the film's premise and establishes a tone. Here, themes of family and legacy are presented. We see the family shown much like a clan throughout the opening. They eat together, work together, and in the form of Miguel's grandmother, they have a leader. We are also introduced to the ofrenda, with a brief mention of Dia de los Muertos. This plays into the legacy theme. The anti-music tradition and shoe business factor into that, but the ofrenda acts as a physical embodiment of the legacy theme. Even by the film's rules, remembrance and legacy are important. Without their memory carrying on, those who have died will die the second death. It's a powerful theme that works because the audience has shown the significance of legacy, both through Mama Imelda and Ernesto de la Cruz. Next to the plot, characters are the most important aspect of storytelling. A well-written character can resonate with audiences and stay with them long after the movie is over. It's no surprise, then, that many films begin with an introduction to a main character, be they hero or villain. This section is pretty self-explanatory, but I'll still provide some examples. Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange takes a more direct approach to this type of opening. The audience is introduced to Alex DeLarge and his cronies in the milk bar. Alex delivers a voiceover monologue as the camera pulls back, revealing more of the scenery. From this introduction, we learn a little bit about our main character and his world. The milk bar is filled with sculptures of naked women acting as decorative objects, and the milk Alex and his gang drink is laced with drugs that elicit violent behavior. From this brief opening, the audience gathers that Alex lives a life of debauchery fueled by drugs, sex, and violence. It's simple, but it works. In a more subtle style, we have Mike Nichols' The Graduate. Much like Coco, it's a little difficult to pinpoint the exact moment the opening ends, so I'll just say it's when Simon and Garfunkel's The Sound of Silence finishes. The film opens with a close-up of Benjamin Braddock, played by Dustin Hoffman, which pulls back to reveal he's on a plane. We then cut to a shot of Ben on a moving platform where he gathers his belongings and leaves the airport. The final shot of the intro shows Ben surrounded by a fish tank. Upon first viewing, this is a simple opening, but on closer inspection, quite a bit is revealed about the film's protagonist. The shot in the plane shows that Ben is just another face in the crowd. He's rather plain and doesn't stand out. He stands idle on the moving platform while others leave him behind, communicating the sense that the world is passing him by. Finally, the shot with the fish tank is representative of his feeling of drowning. All of these points are expanded upon throughout the film, but right from the start, Nichols gives the audience a taste of who Ben is. A framing device is a technique used to house one story inside of another. It isn't incredibly common, but it does happen frequently enough to be worth mentioning. I'll keep this section brief, as the concept should be easy to grasp after I provide some examples. The first example I want to look at is the opening to The Princess Bride. The film opens with a kid, sick and bedridden, playing video games. His mother comes in to tell the boy his grandfather has come to visit. The grandfather enters and gives the boy a gift, a book that's been passed down from generation to generation. The kid agrees to listen to his grandfather read the story, and the audience comes along for the ride. From there, the film tells the tale of Wesley and Princess Buttercup, occasionally checking in on the kid and the grandfather. Similarly, we have The Bride of Frankenstein. The film opens on a dark and stormy night as Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, and Mary Shelley enjoy the evening. Byron praises Mary for her Frankenstein story before giving the audience a brief recap of the first film. Mary informs Percy and Byron that there's more to the story and then proceeds to tell the tale of The Bride of Frankenstein. Of course, frame stories can come in many forms, including setup for flashbacks, vignettes, or a recap of events leading up to the current situation. The biggest advantage a frame story has is that it allows the storyteller to pause the narrative to provide context. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. This was a nice change of pace for me outside of doing all the regular film reviews. If you liked this video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to see more like this, just let me know in the comments. I know that there are other things that a film opening can do outside of the five things that I mentioned in this video. So depending on the reception to this, I might make a sequel to this video. It just all depends on how this is received. I have some other episodes of Silver Screen Academy in the works. So until then, I'll catch you later.